All right. Um, if you were here last year, you may remember um, that I, I did a piece just like the piece I'm going to do now, which is, which is to show you clips from a video interview that I did uh, with this gentleman here, Dr. Jordan Peterson uh, of the University of Toronto. He's a clinical psychologist. He's becoming quite well known. Um, you'll see 200 plus YouTube clips of him doing lectures, interviews, uh, presentations. He's been showing up in newspaper articles around the world and he's been showing up in, on uh, national TV uh, networks doing interviews and really tabling in quite a bold and um, straight way the kinds of contentious issues that need to get tabled and addressed, societal issues and so on. And there's a and he's not a guy for holding back in these, in these interviews and, and with his opinion, so he's quite a straight shooter. And there's a particular thing that he talks about in some of his um, interviews and presentations, and it's about telling one's truth, like, like speaking your truth, or at least don't lie. Um, and, and the way that he talked about it is what got us interested in examining and exploring whether he'd like to make a contribution to the, to the conference this year. So a few weeks ago, I got connected to him by Skype um, at his home in Canada, and, and uh, there was a camera crew, professional camera crew like the guys who are here, um, capturing what he had to say in response to questions that I was posing or inside of the conversation that was unfolding between him and me by Skype. Um, let me show you, so that's what he looks like, you'll see him, you'll see him on screen in a moment. Uh, he wrote a book called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Um, there are two websites if, you, if you're interested in, in uh, checking them out one called selfauthoring.com and the other one called understandmyself.com. Um, and basically, they, they give you uh, insights into oneself and a view of the future, and you can self-author, as it were, your future. Um, so this is, this is the kind of stuff that he is engaged in creating. Uh, he does it with, with partners, um, uh, and those things are available. Let me show you... Uh, the 12 rules for life from the book. I'm not going to explain every one of these, it would take too long, but I'll dip in and out of them. This is rule one to six. The first one is rule one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Do you remember your mother telling you that? Yeah, it's the same thing. He's basically saying the same thing in his message. Um, it's stand up straight with your shoulders back, like take things on uh, with a straight back. Treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping. Put yourself in the picture. Make sure that you're getting your own help and not just helping others. Make friends with people who want the best for you. Anybody here got friends who don't want the best for them? Well, a good rule for life is make friends with people who want the best for you. It's just a good rule for life. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. That, I, that feels like it should be on a, on a thing on your desk, right? Like that's worth reading every day. Compare myself to who I was yesterday, not to who that guy or gal over there is today. Do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. Yes, that should cause some uncomfortable laughter around the room. Yes, Ooh, yeah. my kids do things I don't like. Mm. Um, that's, that's, about, that's about providing the straight and narrow and having your kids go on the straight and narrow in life. Right? He talks about, you know, three-year-olds throwing tantrums and ruling the shopping mall and, and ruining 150 people's experience of the shopping mall while they do it. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. This got me 
square on the chin last week at work, two weeks ago at work. I was walking through the office and I really had an opinion about other people's desks and what was on top of them and what was underneath them and how the plants looked. And I, I was like, ooh. And then I got back to my own desk and it was really bad. So my desk got a serious spring clean two weeks ago. Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Again, another good rule for life. These are, these are not rocket science, right? But good things to live by. So this is the kind of work that this man does and, and promotes. And then the second half, seven to 12, pursue what is meaningful, not, as, not what is expedient. Know what your values are and go after that. What, what, what has meaning for you? Pursue that, not what's easy to get done or quick to get done or I can get done by three o'clock today. No, pursue what's meaningful for you. Here's that one that I made mention of, tell the truth or at least don't lie. Number nine, assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Do you ever have that experience where someone's talking to you and all you can hear is blah, 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 There might be some gold in there if only you were to assume that they know something you don't. Number 10, be precise in your speech. I'll come back and talk about that a little bit later and, and he will in one of these videos as well. Do not bother children when they are skateboarding. Do not bother children when they're skateboarding. My interpretation of having read this chapter in the book, this is, a, this is about unintended consequences. So kids skateboarding and running their skateboards along the edge of concrete curbs and stuff, and the council put thing, bobbly things along so that they can't run their skateboards along there. And then instead they go climb the roof on the school. Oops. I would have preferred them to skateboard, not climb the roof on the school. That's, that's my interpretation of, the, of that chapter. And then the last one, pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. I'm more of a dog fan myself. Um, and, and I think Dr. Peterson is as well. But the, again, I think the point of this one, again, my, pres my interpretation of this is um, stop to notice what's going on. Find the gold in, in, in the everyday, All right? So, in my conversation with, with Dr. Peterson, I, I said, look, um, this is all fantastic. I've had a look through your book. I've had a good read of it. I love what, what, a lot of what you say in there. Um, and it's too much for us to bring to this conference, this annual conference that we do. This is what the audience is made up of. This is the industry. Safety leadership is typically the context of the conference. Which three would you say, these are the right three to talk about for this audience? And he said, oh, that would be rule one, two, and seven. Just like that. Didn't think much, he just went, that's rule one, two, and seven. So stand up straight with your shoulders back, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping, and pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. So, the first clip, we, I have seven clips to show you, but they're quite short. Uh, and, then, and we'll break this up with conversations at your tables as well. Um, but let's show, let's switch to the video and show the first piece where he talks about these are the three rules I think are the right three to offer the conference. Rule one is stand up straight with your shoulders back, and it's about a general attitude towards life. So hierarchies are very uh, stable features of, of life in general, and certainly of human life. And wherever you have any system of values, you have a hierarchy, because a system of values implies that one thing is better than another, if you have a situation where one thing is better than another, then some people are better at doing it than others, and you get a hierarchy. 
to stand up straight with your shoulders back is a literal injunction, but also a metaphorical injunction, because what you do when you stand up like that is you kind of expose the vulnerable surfaces of your body. Now, it's an act of courage. It's an act of it's an act of taking on the voluntary responsibility of contending with hierarchical organization and uncertainty. And it's a very good, it's a good physical manifestation of the moral courage that's necessary to live life properly. And it's something that leaders naturally embody. And that's true not only of human beings, by the way, it's, it's also true of animals all the way down the biological chain. So the more successful creatures, let's say, are also those who comport themselves in an upright manner. And, you know, even in our common language, to be upright is not only something that we think about physically, but also morally, right? To be an upright person is to tell the truth and to act forthrightly and to do what you say you're going to do and all of those things. So that's all of a piece. And so that's rule one. Rule two, which is treat yourself like you're someone responsible for helping. That's an extension of rule one in some sense. The idea would be that you know, people are often ashamed and embarrassed and anxious because of their insufficiencies and failures and 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 the incomplete nature of their characters and and all the things they don't know and all of that. And so it's useful to to um, develop and practice uh, an ethic of detached self-regard. Like it's not narcissism. It's not self-esteem. It's it's. It's, it's not grandiosity, it's none of that. It's just the clear realization that as other people have value and as it's necessary to treat them that way, if you want anything in your relationships whatsoever to go right, so it's also necessary to develop that attitude towards yourself, despite the knowledge you have of all your inadequacies. And that's a really good thing to practice because it requires practice, both the detachment and then that ethic of care. So, and then rule seven, which is do what is meaningful rather than what is expedient, that speaks to at what level of analysis you should be operating when you're deciding how to act. You want to act in accordance with your highest values. Now, that means you have to figure out what those values are. If you act in accordance with your highest values, sometimes that makes your day-to-day -day operations difficult because you have to confront unpleasant truths. You have to discuss things that you'd rather avoid. It would be easier to act to decrease conflict in the moment. But it's a very bad medium to long-term strategy. You have to engage in a certain amount of conflict moment to moment if you're going to say and do the things that are necessary in order to set things right in the medium to long term and for an increasingly large number of people. And that's also another guide to leadership, I would say. So that's what Dr. Peterson had to say about which three rules out of the 12 would he choose to share with this group. Um, he got just right at the end, he got into saying something about leadership and I, and, I, and I wanted to know from him, um, from, from, from the perspective of the human makeup, what does he say makes a leader? And, and you know, I, I talked to him about from, from the work that I do with leaders, I, I talk to them about their sense of frustration and my sense of frustration for them that they often get pulled around by, by what Microsoft Outlook says is next rather than being direction setters, but really circumstances kind of pushing them around the office or pushing them around the, the workplace. Um, so I said, in your view, what makes a leader? And here's what he had to say about that. You need a broad scale vision. You have to know what it is that you're doing with your life 
let's say, generally speaking, but more particularly in the next three to five years? What do you want? What do you want from your friends, your family, your intimate relationships, your employment, your education, your care of your mental and physical health, your response to temptations like drug and alcohol use? Like, if you could have what you wanted, if you could lay your life out properly, how would you be functioning across those seven dimensions? Why would that work for you? Why would it work for your family? And why would it work for the broader community? Then that gives you a reason, a reason. And if you have a reason that's well thought through, that you find compelling, so that's a compelling story, let's say, the kind of compelling story a leader might tell, then that will provide you with motivation to do the things that are difficult that you need to do. So that's positive emotion, that motivation. It's a neurochemical system that runs on the chemical dopamine. And it's the thing that, it's the neurochemical system that underlies people's willingness to undertake something voluntarily. So we experience most positive emotion in relationship to a goal. And what that means is if you don't have a goal, then you don't have any motivation. And so what that means is you better have your goals well delineated. Because that way you'll be maximally motivated. Now the additional advantage to that is that if you have your goals delineated, and they're compelling goals for you, it also makes you less anxious and uncertain and stressed. Because the, your pathway forward into the future is mapped, and that makes it more certain. And uncertainty causes stress and, and physiological uh, load. Okay, so you want to have your large-scale vision, you want to have it thought out on a three to five year basis, you want to have it cover those seven or so dimensions that we already described, you want to see how, why it's relevant to you and your family and the broader community. You want to break that down into your monthly, weekly, and daily practices. And if they can be routinized, then so much the better. And then that becomes built into you. So what happens neurologically is that when you do something new, you use almost your whole brain. That's a good way of thinking about it, particularly the right side of it, the right hemisphere. And as you practice something, the amount of your brain you use gets smaller and smaller until and moves leftward until you basically build a effective little machine at the back that takes care of it automatically. Routinizing things decreases the cognitive and physiological load. It's a big deal. And if you routinize good habits, then they become part of your character and part of what people come to expect of you. Again, drawing on, drawing on a lot of the work that we do and, and, and the kinds of conversations we find among um, this kind of audience or the people who make up this kind of audience and go out to the field or sit with a leadership team at, a, at a, an organization's headquarters or wherever you may be. And there's very often a collapse around leaders are the most senior people. Like, like a, a senior position makes you a leader. And, and we hold the view, and I shared this view with Dr. Peterson, we hold the view that leadership can come from anywhere in the organization. That you, and, and, and I know that here we recognize that, that there are people in the field who have no particular authority, but they're real leaders. They have they cause things to happen and they show the way and they're followed. But they're not managers or directors or they're not particularly senior. So I asked him his view about who does he say can lead, who can be a leader. A leader is someone who can lay out of a, a shared vision, who can motivate people to partake of that vision, often using humor, I would say, and to have a sense of humor is very important, who give credit where credit's due, who hold people responsible, including themselves, and who act out the things they say. The leader knows where he's going, right, and that's well thought through, but then also can communicate that and bring other people aboard for the, for the journey, let's say. So you know how to do what you're doing, you know why you're doing it, 
at a day-to-day -day level. You know why you're doing it at a week-to-week -week level, at a month-to-month -month level, and a year-to-year -year level. You know what values you're serving. You know how they serve you and hopefully your family and the broader community as well. So, and that's all of a piece. And a leader is someone who's thought all that through, I would say, and, and who has a well-articulated vision and an implementable strategy at all those levels of analysis simultaneously. From a practical perspective, what a leader does is take that broader high-end vision and decompose it into implementable tasks so that people know what they're doing, but also is someone who makes a case for why those tasks are of crucial importance not only for the organization, but also for the individual who's being, who's being brought aboard. If you specify where you're going, you're much more likely to get there. And if you have a detailed map, so much the better. People are afraid to do this because it, it requires confronting the future, and the future is a, a hydra of snakes and terrors, you know. But it's there whether you confront it or not, so you might as well confront it. And then you can lay out a plan, and then people get afraid of that because they think, well, what if I'd fail? It's like, well, if you don't have a plan, you're going to fail for sure. You just won't notice it while it's happening, but it'll happen. So it's better, it's better to confront the future, and it's better to have a plan. And the evidence is overwhelming that if you confront the future and you have a plan, that you're much, much more likely to attain it. There's no reason not to do that except that it's difficult in the moment, but it just beats the hell out of slow, horrible failure. There you go. Beats the hell out of slow, horrible failure. It's, it's not completely clear in that little clip, because we, we edited these down to fit, the, to fit the right timing and all that stuff. It's not completely clear, but basically he talks about that applying to anyone. It doesn't have to take positions of authority. It doesn't have to take, a, you don't have to be a certain age or in a certain, at a certain stage in life. Um, he said that can be anybody. So if you're, if you're a leader in an organization, if you're a safety professional, if you're a um, frontline supervisor, a manager, uh, if you're anyone who's on the receiving end of instructions or directions or any of that kind of thing, that covers just about everybody in the room. If you're any of those things or all of those things, you know the value of clarity. And, and seeking and getting clarity. And then you probably know how frustrating it is to think you're clear and then find out that you're not or that you weren't. Right? Does that, that resonate? Yeah, it happens all the time. We're human. So one of his 12 rules for life is be precise in your language. And I, and I wanted to... I asked him to come back to the 12 rules and talk to me particularly about uh, being precise in our language and the, and the value of that. And here's what he had to say about being precise, as he says, it, be precise with your speech. To be precise in your speech does two things. It specifies your goal and it reduces uncertainty. You see what you aim at. And I don't mean that metaphorically. I really don't, because you're a lot more blind than you think. You, there's a lot of the world that you don't see. You see most of what's in front of you in a very blurry way, like your peripheral vision is extremely low resolution. You see clearly a tiny focal area that, that's where you're pointing your eyes. And so... And you point your eyes at what you want to pay attention to. And what you want to pay attention to is generally associated with what you want. So what that means is that the world reveals itself to you in relationship to what you want. And so that's really helpful because you, you want to see the world so you don't stumble blindly through it and fall into a pit. You want to get to where you're going. And so if you specify where you're going very clearly, 
then that enables you to see the pathway forward. Now, the upside to that is that you can probably get to where you want to go. The downside is you also make your conditions of failure very explicit. And that's hard on people in the short term. You know, it's, it's easy to delude yourself and to leave everything vague because then you can't tell when you're failing. But that doesn't stop you from failing. It just stops you from seeing it while it's happening. Then the other advantage to being precise in your speech and your aims is that that helps you tell the difference between what's important and what isn't important. And you want almost everything to be not important. You know, in times of crisis in your life, everything becomes important. So imagine that you have a, a new physical symptom that's distressing and you don't understand it. So then you're thinking, oh my God, what's happening? Am I collapsing physically? Am I, have I got a serious illness? Is it a fatal illness? What's going to happen to my family? Is my whole life going to fall apart? Like, what happens when, when something that you can't specify occurs is that everything becomes relevant? And that's terrible. No one, no one ever wants that. You want hardly anything to be relevant. And so, if you specify your goal, then almost everything becomes irrelevant. And only those things that are important stand up in sharp, in sharp relief. That's also a real boon to the people that you're communicating with because they know what you want then. And so they, even if you're a harsh person, let's say that you're pretty punitive and if people don't do a good job, you, you know, you let them know. If you specify what you want, then they know how to avoid your harshness. And the more precise you are in your formulation of the problem and in your presentation of a solution and the role you might play in that solution, the more likely you are to advance on all fronts. As far as I can tell, there's nothing you can do that moves you and your agenda, your vision, let's say, forward faster than precision in speech. Okay, so we're going to switch back to this. We came across, this is building on being precise in our speech, we came across this um, information a, a couple of years ago um, that answers the question, why do projects fail? And you can see right at the top is per communication and it's, a, and it's, a, it's an outright winner. And then all the others are the rest of the list of nine. But per communication is right up at the top. Um, and a, a piece of our work, this is, this is a, a, a little outtake from some of the work that we do at JMJ, but, the, but the, the use of performance language, getting really clear what the direction is, like where, we, way, where we're going, and the context, why we're going there, why it matters, and how we think we might get there. Having that clear is of huge value. Everybody in here knows that. And then some of the simple things that we can do in our use of language in the way that we speak. One is make a request and use the word request. I have a request of you. And if it's a genuine request, like no kidding, you mean it's a request of somebody, they can accept, decline, or counter offer it. Have you, ever been, have you ever been on the receiving end of a request that you knew wasn't really a request? Or an invitation that there, was, there wasn't a no to? If it's a genuine request, somebody can accept, decline, or counter offer. And how that works is yes, no, or I'll tell you what. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an authentic conversation. Another one is make promises. How many times a day do you find yourself saying, I'll get back to you on that? Or how many times a day do you find yourself accepting that answer? I'll get back to you on that. And you know it's code for one of these days, maybe. Again, that's part of being human. But if you make a promise to somebody I promise to deliver that to you by five o'clock tomorrow evening. 
it puts a whole different spin on the conversation. It puts you in a different frame with the person you're making the promise to. And not all promises get delivered bang on time and bang on what you said you'd get done. They don't all get done. But as soon as you know that it's not going to get done, be in communication and revoke the promise. Withdraw the promise. I'm revoking my promise. I just realized I'm not going to get it done or something a lot more urgent just came on my desk. It'll be five o'clock Monday. I re-promise, five o'clock Monday. That's very precise language. And it gives both of you something to go on. And then the final one here, just in this example or this little outtake, the final one is make demands. If you're in a position of authority, you can make demands. But use them sparingly. If you make a demand every five minutes, they just don't sound like demands anymore. They, everything is equally important hugely urgent but if you make requests when it's appropriate and only make demands when appropriate i have to have this by five o'clock this evening there's no other choice in this you must give me this by five o'clock this evening and be willing to take whatever else is off them so they can get it done but know that you have a thing called a demand at your at your uh, disposal. And there's no accept, decline, or counter offer a demand. Only a person in authority can make a demand, and there's no, sorry, I can't get that done. So only use them sparingly. Does it make sense? Great. Um, quick pause. Talk at your tables for five to seven minutes. What are you getting so far from Dr. Peterson's videos? What are you getting so far from Dr. Peter's videos? When we work with clients, and, and, and you'll see this a lot in your own work, when you, when, you, um, when you carry out audits or you carry out surveys or you um, do behavioral studies, um, interview people to find out, you know, how did things work around here? What's going on around here? What's the current reality? Um, and if you talk to senior people, you'll very often get a story that, well, well, we still have a lot of people not following the rules, or we still have people who don't follow procedure. Um, if only they would follow the procedure, then things would be better, or if only they would follow the procedure, they, they wouldn't get hurt. And then, and then you've got, you talk to people in the field and they say, well, not all the procedures make sense. Or you get to a point in the procedure and then, and then the situation doesn't allow you to follow the procedure, there's something else you gotta do to finish the job. Um, and we've gotten better and better and better at refining those over the years, and still there's that story, there's still there's that commentary about um, people not following rules or people, um, and, and, and some who do, of course. So I got into a, I got into a, a little inquiry with Dr. Peterson around who follows procedures or what kind of person follows procedures and what kind of person doesn't. Like, you know, is it, is it, is it, a, is it a type of person? You know, we could, we could go, oh, you know, all across the field, people don't follow procedures, but there are people who do. Um, and they're usually pretty quiet about it, and they're, and they're usually unsung. And then there are people who don't. So, to my, no, no, I wouldn't say to my surprise, but to my interest, he got into talking about personality types, and the possibility of screening for certain personality types if you've got safety critical positions that you have to consider. So, let's hear what he has to say about that stuff. 
psychologists have pretty much settled on a model of personality that has five dimensions. And so each person be, can be characterized on each of these dimensions. So the first of them is extroversion versus introversion. And it's a positive emotion dimension. Extroverts are assertive and enthusiastic. And introverts, by contrast, are more likely to want to work alone. And they tend to find social interaction with people rather draining. And the second dimension is a negative emotion dimension. It's often known as neuroticism. The reverse of that is emotional stability. And people who are high in negative emotion or neuroticism, so they're threat sensitive. That's a way of thinking about it, or sensitive to uncertainty. And so they might exaggerate risks or they might be sensitive to them. So it's not necessarily a bad thing because risks do exist. The third trait is agreeableness. Agreeable people are compassionate and polite. And disagreeable people are more harsh and blunt. Uh, more out for themselves, I would say. And more likely to want to work with things than people. So engineers typically are quite disagreeable. So are lawyers. Especially litigators and people like that who engage in conflict for a living. Um, the next trait is conscientiousness. Conscientious people are orderly and industrious. And conscientiousness is the best predictor of workplace success for managers and, and administrators, um, executives generally too, after intelligence. Generally speaking, conscientiousness is a very good trait for predicting workplace success. Um, it's not true for entrepreneurs and creative people. That's the last trait, openness. Open people tend to think laterally and creatively. Um, they tend to hop from project to project as a consequence of their spontaneous interest. They're the sort of people you want around if, you're, if your company or your organization has to move sideways in a hurry. They're not the people you want around if you have an algorithm that's already designed that you want implemented carefully. That's for conscientious people. To know that dimensional structure gives you a vocabulary for talking about the differences in people, but also a conceptual scheme for understanding them. And those are very deeply rooted individual differences. They're not easily changed through experience. With regards to safety, you want the same things for safety, generally speaking, that you want for managerial and administrative performance, which is high general cognitive ability. That's problem solving ability. And you want conscientiousness. And those are also the people who are least likely to be involved in accidents. So if you're going to use personality tests to screen people for jobs where there's a lot of risk involved, then screening them for conscientiousness is a really good idea. Because conscientious people tend to follow procedures. If, if you have crucial jobs where safety is absolutely paramount, then I would say it's... It might even be legally obligatory to screen for conscientiousness. And the reason I would say that is because employers... This is mostly from American law, but the same general principles apply in most, in most legal structures. You're, you're generally required to use the most accurate current means of evaluation for placement, promotion, and hiring. And what that would mean for jobs where safety is a crucial issue is that you better screen for conscientiousness. My suspicions are that a smart lawyer could make a hell of a lot out of a liability case if it turned out that people were put in high-risk positions and weren't screened for conscientiousness. Now, I don't know that that's actually happened yet, but it's only a matter of time. All right, so get yourself legally prepared. <laughs> We're going to move on quickly to the next one. I asked him a similar question. What, what makes people speak up or not speak up? Getting into that rule around speaking one's truth. What makes people speak up or not speak up? What makes people report or not report? And here's what he had to say. Many managers find themselves almost always putting out day-to-day -day fires, right? They don't have a lot of time often to think week to week or month to month or year to year. It's actually one of the real flaws in the way most companies are run. If you want people to bring up problems, you have to be in a position where you're willing to think week to week or month to month, like in a longer 
term and, and that means you have to be shielded from the immediate fires that you're fighting as well so if you wanted to produce an organization where people were free to bring issues forward what what I would start with to ensure that that was happening would be discussions at the bottom end of the organization first so imagine that you have people who are on the front line so to speak imagine you bring a group of 10 of them together the first question you would ask them is can you provide me with a list of reasons why people might not bring forward what they have to say in this organization or in any organization and then to see if you can get people to discuss how they might be overcome so and then the organization itself has to think through the costs of having people bring trouble to the forefront and the costs of not having people bring trouble to the forefront because if things stay invisible they're not trouble until they're trouble and people like that right they like to have things hidden the problem with bringing things up when there isn't trouble is that you're causing trouble when there isn't any reason for trouble now you might be preventing a lot of trouble in the future but that is those are difficult conversations and you know sometimes it might be the person that you're bringing the problem to who's responsible imagine I'm a, a frontline worker and I know that there's something shoddy going on but if it occurs if, if something goes wrong I'm not going to be blamed for it now if I bring it to someone's attention well then there's all sorts of risk in that for me and, and like direct immediate tangible risk and so I have to be protected from that or rewarded for it very difficult thing to manage so you have again you have to have the conversation with the frontline guys it's like okay well what's our primary goal here to work productively and effectively to make money for the company and for everyone who's involved and to not have anyone be hurt or die unnecessarily okay so we can, we can all get on board with that okay then we have a problem because some things are going to be done poorly because that always happens and we need to be able to report them all right there's going to be impediments to reporting we need to have a discussion about what our collective agreement is in some sense about if it's okay to report and when but then I would also say that clear and believable policies about reporting also need to be in place if I was going to report trouble to someone I would also want to know that bringing it to their attention is also good for them so the company has to think through how do you demonstrate to your workers that reporting trouble is actually rewarded and not punished you have to trust the person you're reporting to they have to be competent and be seen to be competent and you have to know that there are genuine policies in place not just some mission statement because the problem with mission statements is they float in the air and the mission statements often run contrary to the way the company actually operates that that particular um, piece of the conversation really got me thinking there's so there are so many angles and so many different things we could do about getting to the heart of uh, low reporting or um, inadequate reporting or encouraging that goes way beyond you should report we want you to report you're empowered to report these are the things that we say we say this a lot and we have an expectation that people report things or raise things or bring things to our attention but that just that little piece got me thinking wow well, there are a number of different angles and a lot of different things we could we could do to really encourage it and promote it in a, in a different way and from a different place okay um, final piece I um, I'll tell you what I'll do I'll set it up this way let me leave the final word to Dr. Peterson to thank him on your behalf uh, which I did already when I spoke to him um, I'll leave the final word to him on the difference we can make in the world if we so choose I'm a big fan of schedules and lists 
But you have to have the right attitude towards a schedule and a list. So first of all, you make a list of what the things that you have to do that day, what important things you have to do that day. But you want to remember that that list should serve your higher interests, right? Your higher values. So that presupposes that you've already decided what your higher values are and that you have a vision in place. Then you want to decompose that into what's necessary that day. Aim high, let's say, and then concentrate on the day. What are the most important things that I need to attend to so that I'm in better shape tonight than I was in the morning? And if you ask yourself that question, you know, you have to want the answer, which is rather demanding, let's say. You're, you're, it's another example of orienting yourself properly. So your aim is to get the answer to this question. And your perceptions and your thoughts will organize themselves around that question and you'll get answers. Like they'll rise up, you know, in that mysterious way that thoughts rise up. And some of them you'll find uncomfortable because your, your mind will present you with demands to do things that you may have been avoiding or that you find difficult or challenging. But you can, you can train yourself to set yourself a list of tasks for the day that do put you in better shape that night than you were in the morning. It, it doesn't help to shy away from difficult issues because you're stuck with them. They're not going away. The best you can do is something worthwhile in the face of them. And so you figure out what that worthwhile thing is and then that gives you and then you practice implementing that gives you some character and some strength and that's the sort of thing that can help transform you into a leader. What you do is actually important and what you leave undone as well. Both of those things. Like each individual is more significant and more and has more impact than than they think for better or for worse. I mean you can think about it this way, you know, in your lifetime, you're going to influence, directly influence at least a thousand people. And each of those thousand people will influence a thousand. And so that's a million people, one person separated from you. And a billion people, two people separated from you. We live in a network. And we're really tightly associated with one another. And if you hold your head high and you confront the future courageously and you put your life together and you develop a... a, a integrated and valuable plan and you implement it and you're a trustworthy person you have an unbelievably positive effect on everything around you and so it actually matters that you do these things and it, it doesn't i don't believe that it really matters where in the formal power hierarchy you sit you know because you might think well i'm at the bottom of the power rungs what influence do i have and i think that's a bad way of thinking about it because it doesn't take into account the networked issue. And so if you don't want things to be worse, which you wouldn't if you were a sensible person, then it would probably be better to work hard to make them better. And to also understand that you, you are playing a determining role in how reality unfolds when you're doing so. It's not a trivial thing. People are far more powerful forces for good and evil than they believe. So, and I think that's more true, and I haven't come to that realization lightly. So, so, you want to be a leader in the best sense, and a leader in the best sense is someone who makes things better and not worse. And if we all made things better, then they would be a lot better, and that would be a good thing. That's what we should be striving for.